Welcome to Wisdom Trek with Gramps. I am Guthrie Chamberlain, and we are on day 2,239 of our trek. The purpose of Wisdom Trek is to create a legacy of wisdom, to seek out discernment and insights, and to boldly grow where few have chosen to grow before. We are continuing the messages I delivered at Putnam Congregational Church over the past couple of years. This is the sixth of 25-week messages in our series. This message is titled, Stop Churning and Start Resting. I pray that it will be a conduit of learning and encouragement for you. Resting. I think we all need it. I know I need it. Probably still don't get enough. Get more than I used to, but still probably need more than I get. And last week, we continued on our extended series through the book of Hebrews in the New Testament. And we learned to beware of a hard heart. It is caused by neglecting to follow God, which will prevent us from entering that rest that we spoke about last week. And today in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, we'll extend this thought to learn how to stop churning and start resting. Let's begin by reading today's passage on page 1865 and 1866 of your pew Bible. Hebrews chapter 4, starting with verse 1. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of us be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the good news proclaimed to us, just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to them, because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. Now we who have believed to enter that rest, just as God said, so I declared on my oath my anger, they shall never enter the, my rest. And yet his works have been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about that seventh day in his words, on the seventh day God rested from all of his works. And again, in the passage above, he says, They shall never enter my rest. Therefore, since it is remains to, for some to enter his rest, and since those who formerly had the good news proclaimed to them did not go in because of their disobedience, God again set a certain day, calling it today. This he did when a long time later, when he spoke through David, and is in a passage already quoted, Today, if you hear my, his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken about later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their examples of disobedience. I'm convinced that our civilization If some years, thousands of years in the future, a curious archaeologist would uncover our civilization, he would see relics of an anxious society. Vacation destinations provide us havens as we approach that critical zone of burnout. Treatment facilities house countless victims of mental, emotional, and physical breakdowns. Therapists help us to calm the restful, and physicians routinely today prescribe antidepressants and anti-anxiety medications. But unfortunately, our generation is marked by the ingredients of a society that is dominated by anxiety, including apprehension, uneasiness, worry, and dread. The word I like to use to describe our society today is where it seems to be constantly churning. It's sort of like when you have a bad intestinal flu and your stomach is just churning and churning, and you're just waiting for something to explode. That's how our society seems to be today. Churning keeps us awake in the wee hours of the night, ruins our days and robs us of our focus, and drives some to the brink of desperation and despair, while some even contemplate suicide. But the only solution I have found for churning is resting. I find that when I'm not well rested, everything in life seems greater magnitude. Everything seems to hit me just the wrong way. And that is with our spiritual resting. When you think of resting, though, what kind of images come to your mind? How about sleeping in on a lazy Saturday morning, an unhurried afternoon at the beach, drilling in your backyard with some friends, Perhaps a leisurely drive through the countryside or a cozy cabin in the mountains one night. Or maybe it's hiking in those mountains or fishing by a lazy river. 
Now, these idyllic images are characterized by either low stress, low pressure, reduced tension activities, or they're calm or serene, restful activities where we can just step back and go, ah, oh, and just enjoy the peace and the quiet. Our bodies and minds scream for that brief intermission from an unending life. It seems like it's full of drama. And the same is true for our souls. But unlike our bodies and our minds that will break down eventually if we refuse to go without rest, the outcry for this inner person, and this is where people mostly struggle, is drowned out by the busyness and the bustle of today's society. But there's good news, because there is spiritual rest available for us. It doesn't require us to fly to some exotic island, rent a mountain cabin, or pay a masseuse to work out all the knots in our muscles. As we've learned, we'll learn in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, God made a provision for us to daily enjoy the spiritual rest. The problem seems for that few believers actually take this rest, at least on a continual basis, where we live every day in rest. So let's begin with verse 4. Or chapter 4, verse 1. In our Old Testament, God promised the people of Israel that they could possess the promised land, attaining rest from their wanderings and their enemies. But instead of accepting his promises and responding in obedience, they resisted him with hard-heartedness and unbelief. They said, I don't believe you, God. We can't take the land. They exchanged an abundant joy and a refreshing rest. And then for generation upon generation, they had this anxious churning as they wandered through the wilderness of Sinai. What a tragedy. God offered them rest. They refused it. Equally tragic, though, is when God extends that same rest to us as believers today, and we often disregard it. Based on the consequences of our unbelief, Described in last week's message in chapter 3, verses 7 through 19, the author of Hebrew issues another invitation for his readers to stop. Stop churning and start resting. Beginning with the warning in the verse 1 here, the opening conjunction says, Therefore, it indicates he's exploring the logical conclusion of what he talked about last, in last week's message. The discussion of Israel's failure to embrace the rest that was available to them. They had to come close, so close to the promised land, so close, in fact, that they could literally see the promised land across the Jordan River. And yet, you would think that would embolden them to go and take the land, but by, by faith, by belief. But instead, they were filled with fear and said, we cannot do it. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Let us be careful that none of, us, none of you be found to have fallen short of it. And I like how the New Living Translation puts it. It says, So we ought to tremble with fear that some of you might fail to experience that rest. Yes, we must fear God with honor and respect and reverence. But like the ancient Hebrews, we must also fear the worldly, we must not fear the worldly obstacles that are flung into our paths. Instead, fearing God is to keep his commandments by faith and by belief from the numerous distractions and the obstructions that fill our lives every day. The fear mentioned in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1 refers to a healthy respect for the dire consequences of faithlessness, of unbelief, and disobedience to God. It says in verse 1, since his promises of entering his rest still stand. He said, my rest is still available to you today. It was true of that first century Christian Jews, and it's true for us today. The grave danger looms as we just half-heartedly grasp for that rest, or we turn our back on that offer and say, God, I don't believe you. I don't have faith to trust in you, so I'm rejecting you, God. Whether it's we turn to other gods, we return to our own self-reliance, or we say, no God can help me here. But what kind of rest is the author of Hebrews really writing about here? Is it physical? Is it emotional? Is it me mental rest? Well, the author presents the reality available to us as believers. It's a spiritual condition that we're fa affecting us. It's affecting our inner peace, our inner joy, and our hope that we have. 
This is a concept of a place of rest that's explained in verses 2 through 8 in Hebrews chapter 4. God doesn't post warning signs without also posting directions for us. Immediately following the warnings against falling short of that spiritual resting place that God offers us as believers, the writer of Hebrews provides us three guideposts to point God's people toward the appropriate place of rest. We might call it our GPS for entering God's place of rest for us. So if you look at your bulletin insert today, on the side it says, stop churning and start resting. The first question is, what does it take to enter into God's rest? The first guidepost that the author of Hebrews has for us is entering God's rest takes the right formula. Now, I don't want you to get the wrong idea here. The Christian life isn't three easy steps to this or four easy steps to that or seven stages from A to Z in your Christian life. I don't like those formulaic approaches because the relationship with our living God is an exciting and dynamic relationship that we have with him every day. However, we find in verses 2 and 3, there is a straightforward equation for entering the rest of God, and that is hearing plus believing equals resting. If we hear God's word and we believe God's word, then we should be at rest. And that's the formula for it. The author of Hebrews clarifies a simple hearing of good preaching doesn't enable anyone to enter that spiritual rest. Rest from fear, from melancholy, from stress. In my experience, some of the best taught people, some of the most knowledgeable people in the world are also some of the most anxious and the most tense people. For example, the Israelites had Moses and they had heard all the promises and they had seen the promises before entering that land of Canaan. Still, it did them no good just to hear Moses if they didn't believe because they failed to embrace, they failed to believe the promises by faith. If they had truly believed, they would have been acting with confidence. Similarly, we as Christians today have been called to our, from our own spiritual Egypt, from the slavery and sin, so that we can find our, but we find ourselves wandering in the wilderness because we fail to trust God. We fail to trust that God will deliver us into the place of rest that he's established for us before the foundation of the world. It wasn't something new God invented. Well, it didn't work with the Israelites, so I'll come up with this new rest. Now, this rest was established when he created the world. In, the last, in that first section there, it says confidence comes through completely trusting God and resting in him. If you see somebody who's truly confident, now a lot of people act confident that aren't, but if you see somebody who's truly confident, more often than not, it's because they've placed their complete trust in God and are resting in him. In converse to that, if you see somebody who lacks confidence, more often than not, it's because they're lacking the complete trust in God and allowing themselves to rest in that confidence that they have in him. Now, if we ignore this formula, hearing plus believing equals resting, there will be no rest to our wanderings. Because the principle of faith or belief that undergirds everything is that God can provide for our lives. And failure to respond to his word by faith or belief is failing to obey his commands by faith and belief. And if we do this, it will result in discipline rather than blessings in our lives. And the second guidepost that the author of Hebrew gives us today is entering God's rest takes the right attitude in verses 4 through 6. Now, verse 3 concluded that the statement requires some reflection. And I like the rendering in the New Living Translation. It says, this rest has been ready since the beginning of the world, since he made the world. This rest is already here for us. Now, God's rest was part of creation. It's also part of that global Eden that's already here, but not yet completely fulfilled or manifested. The author of Hebrew unpacks this by returning to the count of creation both in Genesis and also in Psalms. The discussion of rest prompted the writer to think that God, God's work in creation, he created the world in six days before resting on the seventh day. But that rest was also part of his creation, and that's what we fail to see. Hebrews 4.4 4 and Genesis 2.2 2 explain that rest. Now, God sits in the place of rest with his arms open 
inviting us to intimate relationship with him, communion with him on a daily basis, because he's already rested. We don't have to strive anymore. He has completed that work for us in Christ, so we can rest in him. God never in intended to enjoy that rest just by himself. His labors, instead, he flung open wide those gates of fellowship for all who would surrender their own labors, their own striving to embrace his rest by faith and by belief. However, the ancient Israelites just didn't get it. When they crossed that Sinai wilderness and approached the promised land, they camped at Kadesh Barnea on the southern border of the Jordan River there. The Lord had opened his arms and says, come into your rest. But they met, were met by fear and trembling. They saw giants in the lands, obstacles too great and pitfalls too, too deep. They lacked faith. They lacked belief that led them to failure to obey. They wouldn't have entered that land. And when frustration and anger, God says, because of their unbelief, they shall never enter my rest. Not because you sin, but because you did not believe in me. God can tolerate our failings. What he doesn't tolerate is our disbelief of him, rejecting him as our God. Likewise, our weakening, our waffling, our waning faith can do us in, just as it did to the Israelites. If we turn our backs on God and reject him, then we will not enter his rest. The most significant obstruction in our path looks like an insurmountable barrier. Even the smallest of all critics of our faith seem like an angry giant in our lives. But instead of fearing the things of the world, we should link arms with the Lord and allow him to lead us in to that rest. As he tells us in one of the most famous Psalms, Psalm 23, verse 4, he says, Even when I walk through the darkest valleys, I will not be afraid because you are close beside me. According to the author of Hebrews in verse 6, so re God's rest is there for people to enter. All we need to do is trust in his word and to believe that he will act on his promises for us. And the third guidepost that the author of Hebrews has for us today is entering God's rest takes the right timing in verses 7 and 8. Now these two verses are the main reason for understanding the rest appropriately as discussed by the author. And he refers to our present spiritual condition. He's not referring to a rest when we get to heaven. He's talking about a rest in our life of faith today. It says, so God, in verse 7, so God set another time for entering his rest. And that time is today, not tomorrow. Not next week, not next year, because every day that we enter into is today. And God says, I want you to enter my rest today. So every day we are to enter his rest. We need to choose daily to dwell and rest continually in him. We need to hear his voice that we have a choice. We can either harden our hearts in unbelief and disobedience or we soften our hearts in faith and belief and in action. This is a constant, ongoing decision that we make on an every-moment basis, an everyday basis. It's not one time in the past we enter his rest and we remain there because all of us know that we run into troubles almost on a daily basis, and it starts churning up within us every day. So every day we need to enter his rest. Not that we're going to be saved every day. That's not what I'm speaking of. It's just that peace and the rest that we have in him. The Israelites failed to enter God's physical rest of the promised land because they lacked faith. They did not believe. They rejected God. And even though Joshua led the next generation into the promised land, the psalmist shows us that there's another, more excellent type of rest that we're to enter. And just as the ancient Hebrews could have stepped across the line into that promised land over that Jordan River and taken complete com um, possession of the land by faith and belief, we as Christians today can find rest for our souls in the Lord Jesus at every moment, at any moment of our spiritual life. So the invitation of Jesus still stands for us today, and it was reflected in the Sermon on the Mount, or shortly after Sermon on the Mount, when Christ said to us, two of the sweetest verses, I think, in all the Bible, 
In Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 and 29, it says, Then Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. It's that, ah, oh, where we just can sit back and relax and rest. Nothing is more peaceful than a soul that is at rest. And as we move on to verses 9 through 11, the same kind of rest that God's entered after his work of creation remains for us today. All we need to do is enter that rest from our anxieties and our surrender those to God, to take God at his word. He says, I have a rest for you. Do we believe him? Just as God created everything for us to enjoy, he also created his Sabbath rest for us to enjoy. He has done everything necessary for our spiritual peace today. He says, today you can enter my rest. Think of it as a reserved seat at a great banquet that the gods put on for us, similar to the marriage supper of the Lamb that described in Revelation. God has purchased the meal tickets and prepared the meal and set the table and opened the doors wide for us. By sending his son, he accomplished the work of salvation. By sending his spirit to indwell within us, he gave us the power to do so. He has given us the means of taking him at his word. The disciple Peter later wrote in his, one of his letters in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, he says, By his divine power, God has given us everything that we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know him, the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. Now, the author of Hebrew then concludes the section that we began. He warns the readers with an example of Israel's failure to enter that rest of the promised land. With all the labor accomplished on our behalf, nothing is required of us but to believe. No one should fall short of entering that spiritual rest because it's granted to all of us. Yet he also clarifies that even receiving this free gift requires that we do something. We have to make a choice. We have to make a decision. We need to act of our own will. We need to choose to believe. His commands in Hebrews is, says in that 11th verse of chapter 4, it says, make every effort. And that's our choice to believe to enter that rest that is available. Now, this word doesn't come out as clearly in our English language, but in Greek, it's a really strong language. It's more than merely exhorting or encouraging or persuading. The author of Hebrew knows that our old habits die hard. You ever tried to break a habit? How difficult that is? And it's reestablish new good habits in its place? So even though all believers should be eager, eager to cross that land into the promised land and begin experience that rest for our souls, our natural tendency is motivated by either self-sufficiency or fear or rebellion. We like to linger on the other side of the Jordan River and look into the promised land and say, oh, that would be nice, but I'm afraid. There's giants over there, and we're just grasshoppers, according to them. But the author of Hebrews couldn't be more direct in his appeal in this 11th verse. He's telling us to stop today, stop churning today, and start resting. So what's the application of our passage today? It's on the other side of your bulletin insert. The application is we need to be overcoming rest. Of the, it's blocked by our enemies, so overcoming our enemies of rest. Have you entered that rest that the Hebrew author wrote about? Or are you still on the other side of the Jordan saying, looks mighty good over there, but I'm scared to go in? Are you wandering in the wilderness and worried about your future? Or you're regretting your past? Or you're frustrated over your present life situation? Have you crossed over into that promised rest? Or are you pacing back and forth, biting your nails, saying, there's giants over there. There's giants obstacles in my life of spiritual progress. I cannot go forward. The ancient Israelites saw these, saw these obstacles and they were frightened. It prevented them from embracing God and his promises for entering that rest. And I can think of two main enemies. 
that stand in our entrance to spiritual peace, spiritual joy, and spiritual hope. And it prevents us from entering that rest and remaining in that weary land. And those two enemies are panic and pride. The first enemy, panic, says, you're not going to be able to make it. When panic kicks in, we begin to see problems that are so big that even, either, even God can't handle them. But think about it. If God can create, take a formless and void world in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, organize it and fill it with abundance in six days, don't you think he can organize your chaos and fill your life with abundance in six seconds or less? He's a God that can do it and has promised that he will. So when panic looms on the border of God's place of spiritual rest, we need to resist it. Instead, we need to enter his rest today. And we may have to remind ourselves tomorrow, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day. But that rest is there for us to always enter. Don't wait until you feel overwhelmed. As we're told in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, this is how we're to live our lives. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead you that you give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, a kind that he will find acceptable. This is truly the way you worship him. Don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. And I might also add, restful. The second enemy of our rest is pride. And this is one I fall more prone to than panic. You can handle the problems on your own. When pride shows up, it convinces us that we don't need God's help. We don't need his rest. With a little more effort, a little more self-motivation, and a little more personal endurance, we can overcome our, strength, our struggles even in the wilderness. But is that wise, all wise, King Solomon wrote in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18, pride comes, goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. So instead of succumbing to that scepter of pride, release it. Enter into his place of rest. Don't try to establish the rest on your own in that wilderness. It won't work. It will fail. To enter God's rest today, we must replace panic and pride with peace. In prayer, we offer God our fears, our worries, our pains, our problems, our self-reliance. And the verse says, 7 says to do it now. And it says, God said a certain day, calling it today. And he'll do good on his promise for finding peace and rest. We need to stand in that promise. We need to bathe in that promise. Resist temptation to go back, to try to work things out on your own, or give in to the fallen world's choices, the fallen world's chaos. We need to begin each morning with a new resolve to enter his rest. And I like the passage in Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 through 24, who sums this up perfectly. He says, The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance, therefore I will hope in him. So as we look at this passage today, we need to make a choice. And that choice is to stop churning and start resting. The next Sunday, our series will continue through the adventure of the book of Hebrews. And as I mentioned, the first seven messages will cover a topic, Christ is superior in this person. And next week's message title is Spiritual Surgery by a Sympathetic Surgeon. So I'd encourage you to read Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 through 16 in preparation for next week's message. Let us pray. Father, we do thank you. We thank you for the rest that we can have in you. We so often struggle. We so often turn our backs on you. We so often think we can do it ourselves. But as we know, when we don't get enough physical rest, how it impacts us so significantly, Father. 
And if we don't have that spiritual rest that you've promised in your word and you have offered and you've already prepared for us when you created the world, let us enter that rest so we can have rest of our soul because a soul is at rest is the most peaceful thing that we can have, Father. Help us today to cross over that border of the Jordan River and enter your promised land of rest. And let us do it every day, Father. We know that our eternity is secure in Jesus Christ, that our salvation is guaranteed, but that daily rest, Father, help us to enter it and give you the honor and the glory. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I pray that this message was a blessing and a time of learning from God's Word. Thank you so much for allowing me to be your guide, your mentor, but most importantly, I am your friend, as I serve you through the Wisdom Trek podcast and journal each day. And as we take this trek of life together, let us always live abundantly, love unconditionally, listen intentionally, learn continuously, lend to others generously, lead with integrity, and leave a living legacy each day. I am Guthrie Chamberlain, reminding you to keep moving forward, enjoy your journey, and create a great day every day. See you next time for more wisdom from God's Word.